Thank you so much, Lawrence, for the talk. Um, your point about accountability was very well taken um, and the need for greater accountability. Um, there's just one thing I, 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 I'd love to get your thoughts on, uh, and that's around, you say that the, the governments are in charge of setting the norms of the legislation. Sorry. Companies, of course, complying with them. Um, what's your take on uh, companies actually actively trying to undermine uh, legislation and norms and lobbying against and infiltrating governments and actually writing the rules themselves as we've seen um, happening uh, with Coca-Cola and uh, and other companies as Coke leaks the Coke leaks story uh, certainly shows thanks I think it's unacceptable and should be called out when we find it I don't have a more profound answer than that you know, you know what, what you'd like me to say but I think it's unacceptable. It should be called out. How do we safeguard it? I, again, I don't know, but that's for this group to figure out. I don't have the answer to that, but we're not even talking about it. Am I? I can't see him. Lawrence, I have two questions or comments. One goes into the same direction. Are those companies really so brazen, or the CEOs of those companies so brazen, that they go out and say, we comply to the code, and then we find out it's only 64% for the best company? I think there must be either a, a communication gap somewhere, or some people are not doing their jobs rightly. That's it's actually 36% um, compliant. Yeah, Nestle was 63. No. Nestle. 36. Yeah? Okay, whatever. <laughs> no, but I mean, there, there's a huge gap. And why is nobody going after them? I mean, you see the CEO from Nestle going around on a World Economic Forum and everywhere and say, we are in total compliance and so on. And he gets away with it. So what's wrong? Point number one. Point number two is uh, a, the marketing of a chocolate bar is about $100 million. To, to get it started. So how, how are we able to fight in, in that arena where the one party has the big money and the really big money and we are looking around for, for donor money in the, in the one to five million arena? Thank you. It'd be much easier to present some regression results. <laughs> Ask you, Ask you. Um, the, uh, so your first point, the generous answer to your first point is that the CEO um, doesn't know about this because it's happening in countries and maybe there's not massive oversight in Indonesia or where I think the example was from Indonesia. So that's a pretty feeble answer. Um, I don't know why they get away with it. I think they must know about it. Um, why do they get away with it? Because we let them get away with it. We don't fund the... We don't fund the necessary research to figure it to, you know, that 36% number, it's partly self-reported, but partly it's people going to stores and, and seeing what the marketing, looking at the labels, analyzing the adverts and the marketing, analyzing the, um, the free products that are given to, you know, it's, 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 it's like research, it's hard work to go out and you have to talk to people and write numbers down and make sure the methodology is right. So it, takes time. So the accountability infrastructure is very weak. And the second, what was the second question, Klaus? Big money. The big money. Yeah, the um, Unilever's marketing budget, so just its marketing budget, well, it is worldwide, is $8 billion. The, U, the DFID budget is $12 billion. So it, the, the power imbalances are huge. But I think in, in the age of social marketing, um, in, sorry, social um, media in the age of um, class action legislation. I think there are some things we can learn from, and people, some people really hate this analogy, but I think it's actually quite apt uh, with the tobacco analogy. There's some things we can learn from the, the anti-tobacco lobby. And in fact, there was the, the Gates and Bloomberg Foundation set up a, um, uh, what's it called, an anti-tobacco legislation fund to help governments fight um, tobacco companies' attacks on 
their ability to enforce legislation around tobacco. It's a small fund and small compared to the resources arrayed in the other direction. But I'd quite like to see something like that. That's something uh, donors could get together and put 50 million into a, a, a pot to help governments enforce the legislation that their citizens and parliaments have passed. They often don't have the resources. The first threat of, of legisl the thir first threat of litigation, uh, they just dropped the case because they don't have the resources. You know, my one lawyer against your hundred lawyers, kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Lawrence. I, first of all, thank you for taking on this challenge, because to bring a rational viewpoint to a very right-brained. Um, explosive top and important topic is much appreciated. I was particularly struck by your comment early on about um, the moral obligation of those who deal with facts to find ways to make them more compelling in, in kind of an anti-fact um, headwind. And I was just wondering if you, in, to date, have come up with any insights as to ways to do that. Um, I mean, there's, I don't know how to answer that really. Um, I think, um, you know, I'm, gonna, I'm, on, I'm on thin ice here because my, my former director general is right here and I don't want to say anything, anything negative. But I think, when I look at IFPRI, uh, IFPRI is not a university. IFPRI is a policy research institute. So IFPRI and organizations like IFPRI have to be in the lead for making research move mountains. And research can move mountains. Evidence can move mountains. But you've got to make it work. You've got to work the evidence. First of all, you've got to do good evidence, right? You've got to produce good stuff. It has to be credible and legitimate and done well. And then you've got to work it. So, so, so for me, 50% of it is doing it, getting it out. And then the other 50% of the effort is working the evidence. So for the GNR, GNR is not a research output, but it uses high quality research 50% is putting the thing together. The other 50% is talking to people, writing blogs, writing newspaper articles, talking to radio talk show hosts, going to countries, talking to ministers, talking to development partners. You know, it's, 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 it's communication. It's trying to change the way people think. Uh, and that can be the most powerful scaling method of all. You, know, you can scale through markets, you can scale through funding, you can scale through implementation or you can scale through ideas and all four of those are really important. So just producing a piece of research and getting it into a good journal, it may be good enough to get you a promotion at IFPRI, or, but I, to me that's not enough. Um, universities are beginning to, come around, be, beginning to become more active in this space as well. So, and I think, I think you know, a lot of people at IFPRI are very good at communicating, um, but they probably need more help. So, so it's just something, and it's, I think especially the older researchers, the more, more senior researchers, have a, a very big obligation to do this, very big. The younger, the younger folks, they're just starting off in their careers, they have to publish to, to survive and all that sort of stuff. But when you get to your, you know, I always say in your, in your 30s you build your own career, in your 40s you build your, um, your organization, and in your 50s you build your field, and, you, and your field is you're communicating. <laughs> Uh, you know about what you're doing. So it's a long answer to your short question. Thank you very much, Lawrence. Uh, one one area you didn't touch on, and I know you've done some work on, is the the cost of a of of an appropriate diet and and how inaccessible it is for some of the low-income kind of households. And I was wondering if you had any kind of insights or directions that you want to explore, you know, on how to bring um, the cost of an appropriate diet down, you know, for those households that procure most of their food from the markets and, and can't afford to actually procure the right diet. And, uh, and a related question, you talked a little bit about the gain marketplace, but what are there you know, it's a, it's a bit of a gloomy picture that you, you painted here. Are there positive examples, you know, of in initiatives or companies that have actually, 
you know, kind of invested in a way in a new market segment, which is, you know, kind of nutritious, affordable food for the poor, and kind of what can we learn from them? Um, I might ask Bonnie to, if you're up for it, to contribute to this question, to the answer. But um, I mean, that's gains, that's can basically gain strapline. How do we create, um, how do we get affordable, safe, nutritious food to people who are on low incomes? That's what we're going to be all about. Um, and I think you're, I think you're referring to this uh, article that came out in the Lancet uh, in August of this year. Um, and I've forgotten the name of the first author, but it's August in the Lancet, Lancet Global Health. And it, it, it posed the question, it said, if we wanted, if we wanted uh, low-income households, I think it was $2 a day, households in India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and Nigeria, to buy five fruits and vegetables a day, which is one of the standard recommendations, how much would it cost them to do that? And I think there's sort of the, there's a number of ways you can purchase five fruits and vegetables a day, but the median way of doing that was it took 50% of household's income to buy five fruits and vegetables a day. And um, so, you know, you, you think, well, how can we get safe, nutritious foods to market that are affordable for people to eat them? Um, the marketplace for nutritious foods is one potential model. Um, but there are, there are things you can do all the way up and down the value chain. So at the very base of the value chain is agricultural research and development. And that's what that book that Alan Berg and Martin Foreman and Per Pistrom Anderson was all about. It was saying, how do we get nutrition um, dimensions factored into, into priority setting for agricultural R&D? So a lot of agricultural R&D is focused on staples right now. And that model, this is a long answer to your question, sorry, but this isn't a short answer. The, the model for, uh, in the 20th century was invest in staples, raise productivity, um, that lowers costs of production for farmers, that increases their profit, but it also reduces the price for consumers. And then if consumers have more income, they can purchase a higher diversity of food. And, more. and that, that model sounds really rational and logical. But you know, if, my, if, the, if, we, if, we, if the ag scientists in the CJ system and in the national level can raise productivity by 30%, and let's say that raises uh, incomes by 30%, right? I mean, it's, it's not a one-to-one, -one, but let's just say it does. Does that help those households on $2 a day that are spending 50% of their income on five fruits and vegetables? I, I don't know if it does help them that much. So I'd like to see more, I'd like to see some more analysis. I haven't even seen any analysis. Hell, I haven't even seen any data on how CGIR spending is allocated across crops. The latest data I could get was 2012. This is for a report we did for the global panel. And it shows, you know, very little funding is allocated to uh, small, small livestock. Very little is allocated to fruits. Uh, vegetables is AVRDC, but that's very small budgets. Mostly it all goes to rice, wheat, um, you know, the, the cereal, the four big cereals. And I think someone needs to do an analysis that says, does it matter how you allocate across the crops for nutrition? And I don't know the answer to that question. So there's lots of things you can do all throughout the value chain. Bonnie, do you want to add anything about, uh, did I paint too negative a picture of the, of the marketplace and, the, um, and other things? No, around? actually, I, I, I'm actually, I'd love to talk to you why that's a negative story. But um, a couple things that, our, our challenge, and I think Lawrence is hitting on this, is just at the farm gate, that food is a long way from the baby's mouth. So there are many places between the farm gate and consumption where the price of food is going up because of inefficiencies, et cetera. In this case, we focused on the market itself, recognizing that many of the poor are accessing their foods, not just from markets, but from small and medium scale enterprises. Another thing to recognize is that people don't eat nutrients and they don't eat crops. They're eating diets. So where we may have data on a chicken choice or a Maziwa King, which is a milk dispensing company, it's the collective data that we have to come up with. With market-based approaches, we can follow a single commodity, but that's still not getting us a diet. So there is a whole host of work that needs to be done in this area to find the metric at markets that have 
impacts and can show impact on nutrition. And I challenge us all. We've started this with some of our colleagues who are sitting in the room, but we need to bring everyone to the table to figure out this, because this is where people are sourcing their foods, and particularly the poor. Gain, Gain's going to be relying on folks at IFBRI to, to do this research, to help us figure out where this, where this all is. You know, where, we should be crawling all over the value chains, figuring out where can we intervene that will make a difference. Um, and I think we don't have much of a clue, really. I mean, Martin Foreman was calling for it in 1971. Um, we can't wait another 45 years. We can't wait another four or five years. We need, to, we need answers now. Yeah. Hi, Hi. Uh, Dan Silverstein. Uh, I'd like to pick on you from the private sector side, if I may, Bonnie. Um, uh, this is becoming a, a passion of mine, I realize, as, I, as each day evolves. And I usually end up thinking these things at, at IFPRI, where it seems almost inappropriate to be imposing the business world on a world of superb research and science, where you exist um, it, it, almost in an unparalleled uh, universe. But you're the one who brought the, the presentation in that said, where's the business? How do we pre bring nutrition and business together? During your uh, remarks, uh, I was struck by your comment that you don't even want your, your staff at Gain doesn't even want to be seen uh, consorting with the private sector. This is just one person. But yeah. Okay, well, <laughs> I, I think it's more universal than that. I, I've seen it at USAID as well in the Bureau for Food Security. There's this where there's this underlying sense of unease as to what they're going to want, and and. I've seen it, uh, and and my, so my my point is that uh, I, I look at at Gain and see that you have really top experts in research and agricultural economics and uh, other areas, but no business people who are able to sit in on the meetings. And I think that's the Achilles tendon. If if I may, for just one more second, while you were talking, I I did something on my computer. I looked, and this is this is a, uh, indicative of what a private sector guy looks at. You were talking about chicken in uh, Kenya, and you had a bar graph that had uh, revenue projections that went actuals from 2.5 to 8, and uh, estimates from 8 to 14 and 14 to 20. They were just numbers I picked out of the air. OK. Well, I'll tell you what. See, to me, numbers picked out of the air are really important. So I sat, I didn't know that they were just numbers picked out of the air. So I sat, and, I, and I'm doing this with a, with a great deal of respect for you. I sat and looked at these, and, I, and, and here's what they told me. That from 2.5 to 8 is 145% growth. From 8 to 14 is 75% growth. And from 14 to 20 is 43% growth. If you're talking to a private sector guy, that's a failing business. And, and if you're going to, when you engage in this conversation with him, you, you have to, you're going in unarmed. And so I, I've made my point. There has to be a private sector guy on your side to protect your interests. I think you just very nicely said to me, you don't know much about business, Lawrence. So, no, no, that's, and it's very true because, because, no, I, I, I don't. It's, no, it's true. But I do know where you need to engage. But the, but, where, you, where you've nailed me on that is because the numbers I picked, the 14 and the 20, were just totally random numbers. And for me, that picture would look like a healthy picture. So for you to tell me that's a failing business, that's a massive learning uh, for me. So we do have some business folks, ex-business folks on the GAIN staff, but not enough. And I was talking to Katrine earlier uh, this week, and I was saying, God, Katrine, I forgot to, I forgot to to tell you, please invite lots of business people to this to this session, and I think we all we all forgot to do it. I don't think there are many. Is anyone here from business? No. And I think we need to some. I think we need to somehow break that um, that dynamic. It's the it's the echo chamber again. So there's lots of echo chambers in nutrition, and this is one. So thank you. I'm not offended. Yes. Hi, Nabina. Hi, Lawrence. Sonia. So I wanted to make a comment and a question, and thank you so much um, for this great uh, presentation. Accountability. I think it's very important that we think about where accountability 
actually comes from the kind that sticks. Um, if we look at the vast majority of public health and social change, the accountability in those areas does not come from research institutions or big donors or governments. It comes from everyday people. In the U.S., the example that you gave on McDonald's, and there are many others, tobacco as well. You had very angry caregivers, family members. In the case of nutrition, it's probably really angry mothers and activist teens and college kids. And we're not reaching them globally. So I think we have to think about what accountability actually looks like and let's not get stuck in our safe space and go out to where it actually um, is gonna make a difference. In terms of um, this point that you had on the private sector and coming together uh, and having that conversation, I think it's incredibly important. It's very important and, and I appreciate and we see it. Uh, folks uncomfortable having those discussions. I'm really curious. I mean, GAIN is one of the few institutions that's bridging, um, trying to work really hard to bridge that gap between, between nutrition and business and the kind of sustained change that we need to see also at a policy level. What's the new strategy for you guys? What are you guys going to be enhancing that we can also be learning from? Um, on your first point, you're quite right. I mean, social movements change the world. Uh, but the challenge is how do, we, how do we organize and mobilize and agitate around this topic? And I think it's really difficult. Um, I, th I think it's real. I don't have a good answer for you. I don't, know, I don't know how to do it. But I do know we need to give those social movements the tools and the numbers and the, the ammunition. They have to be credible numbers and credible ammunition. But without it, they're just shouting into a vacuum, it seems to me. If they can confront people in power with the potential to do something differently with real numbers that are credible, that, that's at least a start. Um, in terms of gain strategy, I'm not really at liberty to tell you about that because if I did, uh, my staff would say, hey, we're going through a process and you just undermined the whole process. But we are going to not be apologetic about businesses and we are going to try to help the whole field negotiate and navigate this terrain because we think it's really important. Um, you can kind of do, you can kind of work with business in a um, below the radar kind of way. And I think, but I think because you want to try and avoid controversies, but I think if you do that, you just set yourself up for all kinds of accusations that you're doing stealth, business by stealth. So we want to do it in a very transparent way. And when people start shouting at me or us, we just engage them in conversation and try to get to the nub and the core of the issue. So because we work in food, because we will be working around how to get food that's safe and nutritious and affordable to people who need it, because one in three people have poor diets, you have to work with businesses. Because we have to work with businesses, we will do it in a responsible and transparent way. And we will, we will call out the good stuff and the bad stuff. And when we make mistakes, we'll also say we made mistakes and you shouldn't make these, the same mistake we made. It's not going to be easy, but it's going to be, it's going to be great. Howdy, I'm sounding like Donald Trump more. Help me, Donald. Help me, Howdy. It's going to be great. I'm even doing this. I'm even doing this. <laughs> no, Lawrence, I, I, I want to congratulate you for taking leadership on this, moving from research to, to communication and now into doing. I think it's, I think it's great. So um, in terms of now taking leadership on engaging with business, then in terms of doing, then the next step is to narrow in and, 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 and score some wins. So do you have any specific things that you think that you might work on to start out with to, to really score some wins in this area? Um, well, I think we are, you know, one of the things that, one of the things about GAIN is that it's kind of, doing some really good stuff. It's actually just terrible at sharing what it does with the rest of the world. So um, we're going to try and change that. It's doing lots of great stuff in food fortification, which is, involves businesses. I mean, it really is. It's kind of amazing, the work it's doing. And I think some of Bonnie's work, although it hasn't gotten to scale yet that we'd like to see, I feel like the fact that all these businesses are rushing into this space is a very positive sign. I think the, the hardest space is the um, maternal and infant young child space. Um, and we're pondering about what to do about that. Um, Marty Van Leer heads that up 
for us. She used to work at Unilever. We've had some, we've had some rather depressing experiences of trying to get formulated foods into complementary feeding. It hasn't worked terribly well. We're wondering whether the adolescent space is a space that might be an interesting space to get into. It, everyone, it, why do I think, why do I say that? I say that for two reasons. One is, um, apart from iron folate supplementation, no one really knows what to do about adolescent girls. Um, so that's what GAIN is supposed to do. GAIN is supposed to come up with innovative solutions, working with alliances of, of organizations, pilot them, evaluate them if they work. Help, help get them to scale. Um, but it seems to me, and it seems to Marty, that um, most people treat adolescents as recipients of programs, not as agents of their own destiny. So um, I've got two adolescents myself, and I know that they are fiercely independent and want to make all their own decisions, and they know what's best. And they never look at any evidence of anything. At least my two don't. They, they're purely run on emotion. So is there a way of engaging adolescents uh, as actors, um, understanding how they access information and make decisions, um, and um, working with businesses to try to establish good eating habits early on in life? I, I, so that's an area we're thinking about working in, but I, it, it's, it's got a long way to go, because if you get that wrong, you really get, you get things I mean, whether you're public or private, if you get the adolescent stuff wrong, it's difficult. Um, but in terms of other wins, I mean, we're, we're looking for ways of engaging with Harvest Plus as well. Um, so Harvest Plus, and you know this much better than I do, is, is in this phase now where it has to try to get to scale. And to get to scale, it, it seems to me it has to work with businesses, right? Um, you have to. But the question is, you're asking me this question because you want to know the answer to it, because you want to know it for Harvest Plus. So you, you, what's, the, what's the entry point for Harvest Plus? You know, which, which products, which businesses? Do you, start, do you start with small or medium, and you have less scale, or do you start with the big ones with potentially more scale, but potentially more conflict and controversy? You spent 15 years building up trust in Harvest Plus. That could go like that if you get those choices wrong, it seems to me. So I, I think it's it's very difficult, and uh, but you know you got Harvest Plus to where it is, so that was difficult. So surely this can't be any more difficult. So it's a long answer to your question, Howdy. I don't not a very good one. The answer, not the question. Well, USAID. Um, thank you for your talk, and I have two questions, one on sun, which you didn't mention, and one on conflict of interest. And I know you've been engaged in some of the scaling up nutrition movement work, and I just wondered if you could comment on the degree to which sun has, um, has already been successful in providing a forum for some of, these, some of these conversations between the private sector and civil society and, and governments and donors, or the potential for sun to move that forward further. since. Some of the idea is kind of to bring sta multiple stakeholders from different sectors together. Um, so any comments on Sun and the utility of that forum? And then also on conflict of interest, you mentioned it, and I think it's kind of easier said than done to ask stakeholders to articulate their conflicts of interest. And where USAID works in a lot of those countries, there's weak governance, of course. So I wondered if you could say anything more about just how we kind of operationalize principles of conflict of interest and, and actually get actors to articulate their conflicts. Thanks. Um, second question, I don't have a good answer for you, Betsy. Sorry, I don't, I don't know the answer. We, we're just finalizing our own, um, our own tool that says who do we work with and who don't we work with. And we're going to be publishing the tool and we're going to be publishing the outcomes of, of that as we, as we work through it. Um, I think it is very difficult, but it's very difficult in all walks of life. It's very difficult for researchers to articulate their conflict of interest. Uh, it's very difficult for NGOs to articulate it. So it's not a business-only issue, it seems to me. And I think it's, it's an issue that we have. You know, even the CG has a conflict of interest because its primary interest is really smallholder agricultural product, production. And I don't think the CG has been very, um, very... Um, evidence-based that's at always saying, is smallholder the way to go versus, and Paul Collier and Stefan Durkan and others have said, 
actually, smallholders is not always the way to go. There are other ways of doing this. So I think everyone has a, a vested interest, and we just have to be really transparent about it. How to make people who don't want it to be transparent, transparent? $64 billion question, I don't know the answer. Sun Business Network, a full disclosure, again, is, as you know, a co-chair of the Sun Business Network with the World Food Program. I think at the global level, I've been disappointed with the Sun Business Network. Um, I think the action is going to be at the national level. And Johnny Tench, who leads from our side, the Sun Business Network, has now, I think, begun to successfully turn it into an, a country-facing platform to bring um, small and medium enterprises together with government and civil society. Now, the way Sun is set up is it's sort of strange because, it, you know, the civil society is in that network and businesses in that network and government and donors. And so I'd like to see more mixing of the networks. And I don't, I don't know how that happens. Um, but I'm going to four of our country offices in January, February in Africa and Asia. So I'll see the Sun Business Network in operation and I'll, I'll have a better answer for you in two months. But good question. I think it has potential, but I don't know if it's actually resulted in anything yet. There's probably some good talking going on, but it needs to, it needs to be action. Rob. USAID. Uh, thanks, Lauren, for the, uh, Lawrence, for the lecture. And um, thanks to IFPRI for, I think this is year 26 of the Foreman lecture series. And it's terrific that that is being kept alive, his vision. and. Thanks to the family. I know, Ken, and you've worked tirelessly, and all your family have. And I, I have to say, it's, I think your father would be very gratified for some of the more recent developments that we see now. Um, the multi-sectoral approach to nutrition that he championed, that came out in 2014, I think it was, Omar, as, as a formal policy uh, for USAID. Uh, we have the, um, the his emphasis on research and the role of research, and we have a, a very vibrant nutrition research agenda that seeks <coughs> to do the linkages that he started. When I came to AID, I knew your father. So, um, uh, and then I think the reintegration of agriculture and nutrition, which when I came to AID and when Marty was leading, there was a directorate for food and agriculture, and he led the nutrition office and somebody else led the ag office, and that all changed. But now with the Global Food Security Act, which was passed this year by the Congress by a huge majority, we've, we have this solidified, this approach. And if anything, the emphasis on nutrition is going up. So that brings me, um, well, and then the last point is, you mentioned the fellows program, I think. And I think it's just remarkable that somebody, 20, almost 30 years after passing a program being named in his honor. And it's a wonderful program that brings in foreign service nationals from around the world to spend time in Washington with the nutrition community. So it's, it's really very encouraging. But I have a question, and that is, um, uh, Lawrence, you know, you mentioned the role of ODA and how it needs to, you know, it's, it's becoming less and less, and, and I, we understand that. Um, on the other hand, ODA is really focused on undernutrition for the most part. So we're thinking about stunting, we're thinking about the thousand days, we're thinking about how to link the outcomes for women, economic opportunities, agriculture, and so forth. So there's a private sector role there that maybe is quite different from the private sector role that, for example, was being talked about at FAO, a WHO meeting on healthy diets, which seemed all about the global food industry. And I just wonder if you have any thoughts about do we need to have a differential approach when we're thinking about the private sector in that, that ODA space? Um, and not to say there's no relationship, I'm not saying that, but I'm just curious if you have any thoughts. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm not so sure how much the private sector does in the undernutrition space. Fortification is an obvious big, ex big exception to that. Um, it's not clear to me how much it does. Maybe others have got good examples for me. But I, I think if we can get the private sector more engaged in creating a healthy food system, that works for undernutrition as well as the other forms of malnutrition, I think. Um, I don't know if that's right, but that's my guess. So I don't think, I, I don't think ODA should be focused a lot on obesity, overweight, diabetes, and hypertension kinds of things. I think o, ODA should be focused mostly on undernutrition issues seems to me. But some small amounts of ODA could be 
could try to leverage companies to do s and governments to do slightly better things in their food systems. I don't know if I'm answering your question, but I think that's, uh, yeah. I also think there's opportunities to do things that have what, what Corinna Hawkes will say, double duty actions, you know. So obviously exclusive breastfeeding, we think it's good for pr prevention of overweight and obesity as well as, in later in life, as well as all the good things it does for undernutrition. Focusing on, um, uh, on um, nutrition education in schools might be good for undernutrition as well as other forms of malnutrition. So there might be some things you can do that are, are both. Um, so I think we have to not pretend that these two worlds are separate anymore, uh, try to look for the overlaps wherever we can. But uh, to, f to have ODA veer into overweight and obesity issues, politically not possible anyway, and arguably not the right thing to do. You've been given the five, either the, either the five minute warning or the five out of 10 rating, I'm not sure what it is. Okay, thank you. Uh, just a letter. Uh, thank you, Lawrence, for the, um, really delving into this tough issue. I think it's a really been a good discussion so far. And I'm really glad about a couple of the previous questions. The last question, um, starting with that one. Um, because two different approaches well, may be needed. Um, and let's talk about sun for a minute, because I was really focused on the undernutrition. At the same time, there's some corporations as members that have been fighting tooth and nail in Latin America to prevent um, taxes on sugar-sweetened beverages, marketing. So that really needs to be thought through. Who are we engaging with on the undernutrition issues that may be really causing harm on the other side. Um, and with respect to you know, the 50-50 split research communication, I guess I'd like to argue it's 10-90. If we're really going to get the accountability that someone also referred to, 90% has got to be that communication. And I'm a, I feel like I'm a researcher. I know how hard it is. You know, but if we're really going to leverage that broad public space, um, I think that's important. So my question is, you didn't use a term that is so often used in this business public context, which is social corporate responsibility. I've never liked that term, but I'm really curious why it didn't come up um, and kind of what your take on is on that and how you see it fitting in or not fitting in. Yeah, yeah, how you see, yeah, see it fitting in or not fitting in to this new kind of paradigm of pot potentially um, engaging. Thank you. Thanks, Jessa. I, I think the, I don't know if 1090 is right, but I, I probably was being diplomatic when I said 50-50. I think you're right. It needs to be more communication than research. I don't know if, how evidence-based your 1090 figure is, uh, but I think I agree with you. Um, CSR, I'll get back to your other point as well, you made three points. Your CSR point, I think CSR is a total cop-out. It's total whitewash, greenwash, bluewash, whatever you want to call it. It's window dressing. So we need to get companies to change the core things they do. And they, companies call it shared value, um, which I don't, really, I don't really know what that means either. But it's about changing the core principles. Um, it's, it's a bit like trying to get agriculture more nutrition friendly. Biofortified stuff goes right to the core and says, how can you just, do, how can you just get, it's not a fringe thing you do at the, at the edges, it's a core thing. Um, and that's what's so good about the, the um, anyway, I won't go into that. The, the issue you've raised about companies that produce snack foods and chocolates and soda and also want to do things that are positive in the nutrition space and will do it in a way that governments direct. And I, mean, I think the example you gave me was even more pessimistic than that. But let's say there's a, a company that's producing all this stuff that is having bad impacts on some forms of malnutrition, uh, and they want to do something positive in another area, another geography with another type of... I think that's the hardest question. I don't have an answer for you. I think that's the hardest question. Uh, Unilever it seems fairly straightforward. Uh, Mars, really difficult. Pepsi, difficult. You're shaking your head. Are you, does that mean you violently disagree with me, or...? Sometimes, 
uh, sometimes when you go to places like Codex to try to um, push for uh, policies uh, and, and standards uh, that will protect health, uh, you see members of these companies actually on the other country delegations and you're fighting tooth and nail um, over these standards with company reps and it's quite challenging. I think it's really difficult, but let me take it to maybe a logical extreme. Under the new U.S. government, does that mean we're never going to work with USAID again? Because there's big parts of the government we don't agree with. So I'm being a bit ridiculous here. But I think this is the really core issue, and I've got no idea what the answer is to this. But if there's a company that's doing producing things that are, I can't call them healthy or unhealthy, but they're just not, they're not part of a healthy diet if they're eaten in too great a consumption, right? And they have certain practices to get certain groups to consume much too much than is good for their health. And yet they turn around and they say, we want to do something positive for undernutrition now. Do we just say, no, fix, fix this problem first, and then we'll talk to you later on? Or do we say, OK, let's talk to you about this. But we, as, we talk, as we do something over here, we're going to be giving you a really hard time over here. Or do you just say, no, sorry, we're not going to do anything? I, I don't know the answer. I really don't. But until you talk nothing will ever get resolved, and we're not really, I don't think we're talking enough. So. I'm going to be after um, putting you off. Thank you so much, Lawrence, for the very frank discussion.